The, uh, the panel we have for today is uh, we have uh, Kelly Fonkhauser, she's the program manager for vehicle usability and automation at Consumer Reports. I once called her a white coated toaster tester. <laughs> and that was, uh, as I recall, that was uh, David Champion coined that in the old days of Consumer Reports. Uh, but uh, uh, we have Kelly that's going to join us. Uh, we have uh, Dr. John Lennon, the Vice President of Risk Aware Driving at Toyota Research. Uh, Manish Marotra, he is the Director of Digital Business Planning and Connected Operations at Hyundai. And then Tim Weisenberger, uh, Project Manager for Emerging Technology and Standards at SAE. And uh, if you are looking, and of course, Bagazaki, the Director of Technical Marketing at Qualcomm, um, if you're looking at the, the order, we're actually going to do it back. I'm a little dyslexic, so we're going to do the order backwards. So we're going to start our discussion with Nagazaki, right there, right in the back. We'll get you mic'd up. Just to mix things up a little bit. But while you're doing that, I would like to invite Paul Caravano up to say a few words. Paul, thank you for allowing us to be at your house again. Sure. Thank you very much, John. So I am indeed Paul Paravano, and I'm in the Office of Government and Community Relations here at MIT, and it's my pleasure to host this group every year. I can't even remember how many years now it has been here, but it's gotten to be a very comfortable thing that when May rolls around, and unfortunately our students are mostly gone because they've finished finals, otherwise I think a lot of them would be here. So we'll have to try to find a date when that works. But I want to say how important it is for MIT to host exactly this kind of group. I'm so delighted that Professor Leonard has joined us. He was with uh, this group a couple years ago. Um, it is our researchers and professors and students who are so interested in exactly the topics that we're talking about uh, today. And one, I always like to point out one big development that's happened at MIT since the last time you were here. Uh, in October, President Reif at MIT announced the launch of the Schwarzman College for Computing. And this is a big deal at MIT because this means that we now have six schools instead of the traditional five that we've had for probably 50 or 60 years. This means that soon uh, MIT will have this new college which will ensure that every undergraduate has a deep-seated learning and, and really uh, extra tools in each of their toolboxes that cover the topics of AI and computer science. So if you didn't think that MIT students were well equipped in the past, uh, stand back because they're now going to have this additional kind of technology. And I want to say one other thing, if I can just get another 45 seconds. Um, there's a new technology out there that if you haven't heard about uh, is terribly exciting for me as someone who doesn't drive and will never drive until we get uh, these autonomous vehicles on the road. Um, but there's a new technology that I'm using that I just wanted to mention. Actually, if I thought about it enough, would have brought it and quickly demonstrated to you. But it is now possible for someone with <laughs> low vision or no vision to wear a pair of sunglasses, a little bit like uh, Google Glass was, um, and have it connected through an app on your smartphone and have you reach uh, a live agent, so someone who can see through the camera that you're wearing and give you immediate feedback and information on your surroundings. So they can read uh, documents that you hold up to the camera and it, it's just the most transformative thing that I've witnessed in a couple years and I know that so much of this is based on the very basic AI and other kinds of research that happen at places like MIT and other universities. So with this technology, you can, uh, they have a dashboard, you know, the agent is anywhere in the United States. They have a dashboard that gives them a complete 120 degree view of where you're looking and um, gives them GPS information and the great thing, one of the great things, there's a lot of great things about this, is that when I call an Uber and I call the driver to try to communicate with them about where they are and where I am, uh, this agent can watch the feed from the Uber uh, on your app and give you exact directions on where the Uber vehicle is. 
So uh, if you haven't read about it, look it up. It's A-I-R-A, ira.io, and you'll read a lot about this startup company out of San Diego that's really changing the lives of people who uh, have lost one of their senses. So again, it's a delight to have you here. I'm going to hand this back to John and hope to see you again next year. Thank you very much. Well, I didn't invest in Autobox. Maybe I should invest in that company. <laughs> uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Mike Zaki. Uh, he is with Qualcomm, and uh, you have a lot of good information to share with us today. All right. Can you hear me okay? Or? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah. So I'm thrilled to be here, actually. It's a great honor for me. And uh, I'd spend the next 10 minutes, if I can, on the next generation vehicle experiences. I will focus on the specific technologies. And the fourth keynote was very good introduction, actually, to my presentation, because how, th how Ford thinks about cars in terms of smart mobility or smart transportation. That's actually the way also we like to think about it. And we think uh, the smart transportation would need some technologies. And the two technologies that I would like to cover a little bit today is AI, for sure one of them, and the other one is 5G, and how that would help with the smart transportation, but also with the in-vehicle experience. So, um, let's see, which one is yours? I'll keep going, actually, so in terms of how we thought about how 5G would be the connectivity fabric for this smart transportation, what we used to have in current generation of wireless technologies like 4G or Wi-Fi, there was big emphasis on how we connect the car to the cloud. And we want to connect it as fast as we can for infotainment or many other things. But the evolution to 5G is bringing a new paradigm where we want to connect cars to each other uh, and their surrounding, and that what with a technology called CB2X, or cellular vehicle to everything communication. And uh, that would be basically a little bit different, that even without any network connection, even if we, don't, if we don't have cellular coverage, that would still work. And the example I'd like to give is if you are driving up to, say, Yosemite Park in California, where there is no cellular coverage, you still want your uh, V2X technology, which is more used for safety, uh, to work even if you don't have this cellular coverage. Uh, so this is the technology. It will allow cars to talk to each other and to talk to the infrastructure of the road. So again, in the Ford keynote, he, we were talking about how if you have the red Ford Mustang GT, you wouldn't be very happy if you are driving in Manhattan. But this CV2X technology is going to solve this problem from a safety and efficiency standpoint. Because now you, the traffic lights will be coordinated, and traffic lights will be able to talk to cars in terms of communicating the speeds and the traffic flow and everything. So that's how we think about the evolution of 5G. It's not only about connecting your car faster to the cloud, but also it's connecting your car to each surrounding. Uh, and then there is another part of 5G that how we're going to connect the sensors on the road, and that's called the massive IoT. And this is where basically the sensors in your car, but also the sensor that would monitor temperature and bridge and the weather conditions and other things would be also connected. So everything would be connecting to each other. So now I, I see the presentation is coming, so I feel a little bit better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can take it from here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so that actually what the visual of what I was mentioning, the enhanced network communication, that's where the 5G will connect you to the cloud, will be used for, again, your connected car services, telematics, or infotainment. And then for road safety, for cars to alert each other if I'm braking and 
that needs to be more immediate. So that's why we have this direct communication between cars and each other. And for traffic efficiency, we have the car talk to the traffic light for, again, speed communication and coordinating of different traffic. And then we connect also the sensors where we have this still cellular connections in 5G, but it's very low power and can connect the smallest sensor you can think of today on the road. So the CD tracks, again, this is going to be very important for safety, but also in the future for autonomous driving and how we're going to coordinate between autonomous cars. And the reason autonomous cars would be great in terms of should be safer than how we drive today, <coughs> but they also have to be cautious in terms of how they take decisions. And by allowing these cars to communicate with each other, we think we'll make them faster and more efficient. So that will help with the overall transportation. At Qualcomm, we, uh, we worked with Ford and many other car companies, Audi, and uh, so we did lots of trials around the technology. It's a new technology. We've done lots of trials, and that actually the technology is gaining lots of momentum in the US and in China, especially. And uh, we have also products for it, which were available since 2017. And we are integrating this technology on every, uh, basically, uh, single model we have in the car. So what was inter what's interesting about this technology, it's part of the cellular family. And that's what makes it more appealing than the Wi-Fi alternative or other competing technologies. And uh, Ford actually at CES last year, they announced that every single car they're going to sell in the US will have cb x technology and it's starting from year 2022. And that's become possible <coughs> because now as Qualcomm, we integrated this technology on our own modem that will go also in every single car that Ford and other car manufacturers will put sell over the years. And for this technology, it doesn't require the network, but how far I can talk to cars around me, very important. So I have personal experience with that, driving in San Diego. I was driving in the freeway, and the typical thing happened, the, stop, the highway stopped all of a sudden. I was lucky enough to be able to brake. I, I barely uh, should stop. And then, but the car behind me rear-ended me. And if both cars had this technology, that would never happen to me, because the car behind me and me would know ahead that the cars in front are braking or the freeway is slowing down. So that's why we are very interested in this technology. We're also interested in making it talk to cars further, because the further I can talk to the car in front of me, I will get the warning ahead of time, so that again can save life. And that's an advantage of this CDBX technology. Uh, in terms of economical cost, it's really good, because now it's going to come with every single modem that comes with new cars. And that doesn't re represent an additional cost in cars, which is very important. That has been in leading B2X technology or medical everything communication technology to take off for a very long time. And that's an example of how this technology would be used in an urban scenario, where these cars would be equipped, the cars and the traffic lights would be equipped with the technology. And again, if this red truck crossing the intersection the cars will get warning that this guy actually is, uh, is uh, basically violating the traffic light in this case. Also, if more importantly, most of the accidents that happen today, especially with SUVs and us being busy on our smartphone, happen to people, to pedestrians. And that's why when we have this technology in the smartphone, people will be alerted, but also the car will be alerted to avoid the traffic. And then lots of possibility in terms of communication between the infrastructure or the traffic lights and the car in terms of what's coming next and the coordination between different traffic. This technology we use today for safety mainly, but it has an evolution path into what we call 5G new radio for autonomous driving. And this car basically instead of now communicating between each other, this is my speed, I am braking right now. I will be able to communicate between cars and each other all the sensor data. I can tell the cars next to me what I am seeing. And so I can also tell the cars around me what I'm about to do. And that's, again, very important for autonomous cars, because, again, autonomous cars will be very cautious. So imagine this scenario if you are in a left turn. For us, as a human being, we'll be able to see cars coming, but if they are far enough or slow, we'll be able to make a judgment call and do a left turn. Autonomous cars, it will that would be hard for autonomous cars. So sometimes they would have to wait till it's almost clear. 
But if there is this communication between cars coming on the road and my car, that would facilitate the, or solve this problem. Um, so again, um, these are some of the benefits of this technology. So that's what I have for cv to x Maybe you can discuss more on the panel. Uh, because of the theme of, about the vehicle experiences, also I want to talk a little bit about how 5G and AI will redefine the vehicle experience. And especially with artificial intelligence, now we see things are being very interested when it comes to the digital cockpit or the internal of the cars. And we see many new car experiences that would happen, how, how the experience will be customized. So as you know now, many of the cars will have camera inside, and this car will be able to basically detect if I'm distracted or not. And we call that contextual safety, especially with AI. Now this camera will be able to tell more things about me, how I'm driving, or if I'm distracting, so it can say what. Also, lots of personalization. Once I get inside the car, the car will know if it's me driving, or my wife, or someone else, especially if it's a ride share. And then all the experiences will be customized with the AI for it. We started to see lots of voice assistant applications, like the Alexas and the Google Assistants in the car. And that, again, will require AI and lots of customization. And all of these things would require lots of compute inside the car to enable some of these use cases. So that's one of the use cases when we combine VR or AR, uh, augmented reality applications, with V2X. So now, as you, as you drive, basically you get very accurate navigation of the road, but you can see how you navigate inside, how you navigate in the city on the uh, windshield. But also you could get some alerts. So now instead of telling you there is someone crossing the street through augmented reality with V2X, you will know exactly where is the guy and you will get a better experience and be able to detect things in a better way. And also inside the car, is it changing a lot? So we see lots of displays inside the car more than before. And everything is turning to be digital, starting from your digital cluster that we started to see in many cars, the all the augmented reality stuff, the rear seat entertainment, and many displays. And now we see on some of the new models that are coming, one big display that come in front of the car displaying many things. And Lots of cameras also inside the car, the one would detect basically who's driving or distraction, but also cars, cameras around the car for ADAS. So we see uh, all these things, and we see also in terms of the increase of the need for artificial intelligence and doing more compute. And typically in cars, you would have anywhere between 80 to 120 small computers or microcontroller controllers based doing many different things. And the trend that we see also happening in the market is how these microcontrollers are consolidating into few big uh, CPUs or CPUs or chipset pieces of electronics that will control everything. And to do that very well, and this is basically how we see all these ECUs or controllers, one of them for the rear seat entertainment, one for the digital cluster, one for the surround view monitor in your car, one for the central information stack or the cameras, and we see all of them actually consolidating into one or few SOC chipset in the car. And this chipset has to be very capable in terms of compute and what they can do. And that's actually what also we offer as a company in terms of adding lots of this technology in our silicon. <coughs> but also on top of that, we are able to design this silicon in a way that handles the new use cases in terms of artificial intelligence and other things. So yeah, that was just a very quick introduction of what we, our vision about smart transportation in car experience and what we are doing in this area. Thank well, thanks very much. We'll save the uh, questions for the end. And, uh, Uh, next up, we have Tim Weisberg. He's project manager for emerging technology standards with SAE International. I think I think I'm still an SAE local member. And we thank you for your support. <laughs> and my ninety nine dollars I spend every year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, see, look, apparently no one has good enough vision to be able to see the, 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 the laptop. I know, we need Ira. Sad but true. Uh, yes. We, yeah, we just need to get it back. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. And I can do something to do. Yeah, thanks. I think I've got the Otterbox idea. Yeah. But I'll uh, fill you in a little bit on Tim. Tim uh, has 30 years of professional experience, including uh, positions at uh, USDOT, Monroe, Chicago Transit Authority, and officer at the uh, United States Navy. Um, I, I've noticed that most of our speakers don't, can't seem to hold the job. All right, thank you. Okay. So yeah, my, my little joke about the Otterbox. I think uh, we're going to have to have some kind of wearable uh, because of the last presentation, there's so much stuff in the car. You got to concentrate on driving somehow. Yeah. Some kind of blinders. Yeah. It, you know, it certainly works for racehorses. So, uh, first, thanks uh, uh, for this opportunity to speak. Um, I think the whole industry is really in an exciting space right now, and certainly what I do at SAE, uh, I think, is a very exciting uh, uh, time. Um, so. Um, First quick, a little bit of a commercial, what SAE is. SAE is a society of individual uh, automotive engineers. So our members are not companies or organizations, they're people, right? There you go. Okay. Um, and uh, what we like to say is our mission is to really be the mobility standards leader. Uh, we develop standards in mobility, right? Uh, I was listening uh, earlier at our keynote, it's really not transport or, or automate, uh, automated vehicle or whatever. It's about mobility. So we're a mobility company now. And, and, and in fact, I think Ford also calls themselves a mobility company. So we're in good, um, a good company. But we, uh, in addition to um, uh, engaging industry to develop standards, we also convene industry and try to bring uh, like-minded individuals with subject matter expertise uh, together to s sort of solve problems um, and not always uh, in a standards environment, sometimes uh, in pre-competitive research, at events, things like that. So um, we, we are very large. We have over 200,000 engagements. I think it's about 130,000 people, but we, we count, you know, when, you know, events happen or people use our publications or come to speak and I mean that's a that's a lot of engagements we have with the broad industry and uh, addition in addition to um, the ground vehicle side we also have uh, at, at least 50 percent of our standards are in aerospace so we kind of I, I'm, I'm we're just waiting for us to have some shipping standards and then wings wheels and a keel we got it all um, so uh, Here's our, and our, my, my, uh, my slides aren't going to render nearly as nicely as our last speakers, but um, this is sort of in a nutshell how we develop standards, right? The, the key words here are, it's open, it's collaborative, it's volunteer, everyone represents themselves, not their company. And it also, as you can see, takes about three years. Now, there's a lot of benefits to it, though, because we are pulling together all of industry, all subject matter experts, everyone sort of gets a bite at the apple to, to develop uh, an industry best practice or a, 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 a J standard. And I asked when I started, why did we call it a J standard, like J3016 with our levels of automation? And no one knew, and someone looked it up, and I guess it stands for journal. Uh, like like in, uh, in flow charts when you have something that looks like a punch card. You know, people that are younger than me don't understand that I'm sure. Um, but anyway, so it takes a long time, but it is very robust, and everyone, you know, uh, uh, feels like they've done a good job. Every, you know, we have broad industry support for those standards. Now, some of the drawbacks is it does take time. People are just volunteers, so they get busy lives with busy jobs, and they're trying to cordon off time to develop standards. And I, I think it's important to note at this point that. SA does not develop standards. We don't write standards. You all do, or you all could. We just provide the forum for industry to come in and, and write standards. So my subject matter expertise, the experts that I work with are the ones who write the standards I know. Um, they wouldn't be as good if they you know. Now, one of the caveats to this, and this is going to be what I'm really going to talk about today, is that really doesn't, that model right there doesn't work well when we're looking at emerging or disruptive technologies. So, 
what do we have to do? So writing a standard for something like automation or cybersecurity, EV hybrid, it's kind of like jumping off the cliff and trying to build the plane on the way down. Right? It doesn't, doesn't work very well. So we have to look at a new model. And what have we been doing at SAE? Well, we think we're building that plane because with these new methods, new technologies, new approaches, new business models, we really can't wait for it to be invented, right? We're trying to do things as we go. So generally what we start with is a simple sort of language-oriented standard. Uh, Kelly and I were talking about this. So something like J3016, which is our standard that is the taxonomy terms and definitions for vehicle automation. So it's those automated levels of so zero through five that everyone knows and loves. Um, but it's tough to get under the surface of that to get to real technology development and standards. So we do more collaborative, but not fully open, pre-competitive research. We do that in a couple ways that I'll get into, but when we combine that and feed those open collaborative standards, we really get broadly accepted industry best practices as we go, while we then get that, that JACE, that journal standard that you know people like NHTSA and the, and the DOT love, and industry knows, okay, I've got the blueprint of what I have to do. Um, so, what we do, there's really two methods uh, that we, we use. One is cooperative research projects. And our cooperative research project um, um, uh, process is very uh, <coughs> mature. We've been doing this for a couple of decades, 85 odd projects. And so what we do is we, we have a very successful program that we now can use to when you know, a piece of research comes up in a in standards group or through industry or even whispered in our ear from, from a state or local policymaker, we can say, huh, that's interesting. Grab uh, in, a, in a sort of an opted in group uh, a bunch of industry, um, and now, now we're not individuals, now we're companies. So we, let's say, grab 10 individual companies and say, yes, that pre-competitive research project is something I'm interested in and I want to put some resource to. So the key to this is it's kind of a one-off project that targets some element that needs to be you know, codified. And so that research can take the form of a white paper, some testing, what have you. And so those, let's say, because it's round numbers, that 10 group, 10, that group of 10 organizations comes together. SAE can act as the administrator and, and project manager, where what we do is actually scope, schedule, and budget the piece of work. Everybody agrees to it. The technical experts from the company say, yes, I like that. Then we get people into NDAs and agreements, and they actually chip in their portion of the development cost. So what we do here is develop, a, uh, develop these things with paid technical contractors, technical resource. So we speed development because you're not waiting on someone who's a volunteer. And we also have the funding to keep this, keep this moving. So that process is what we call our expedited development approach, or it can lead to that. This is one aspect of this. So uh, the difference is it's truncated a little bit. You see it's 12 to 18 months. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention to this middle portion where what's nice is we have that project team and it drops out program deliverable or deliverables. And that's available uh, broadly to industry. So while we're waiting even for this J standard at you know, 12 to 18 months, if our, our task is done in, in eight, it goes out to industry. Um, and this can be done, again, either with, with uh, industry funding, individual companies, uh, or with government funding. And I'll, I, I can get into that a little more uh, uh, in, in, in future slides. But So the idea is we can have schedule and budget adherence, wh where we can't really have that in a collaborative open environment because it just kind of has to, we're herding cats and it has to develop. Um, and so just to put a finer point on how it's developed, what we do is we create sort of a, an expert panel that's made up of folks from our, our uh, standards committees, but also industry at large. Anyone who has the right subject matter expertise can come in there. And if they agree to the scope, schedule, and budget, and they want to come on board with the resources that, that are necessary, we do that. And um, so what we do is keep the, uh, a, a, an SA standards committee that is a, a pertinent um, uh, discipline area abreast of the development so then when it's ready to become a standard, you're probably more in the 80 to 90 percentile of a, a finished document, and we can just go into our review, finalization, and then balloting. And so hopefully we turn the crank much quicker um, and hit that 12 to 18 month uh, 
at all. So, some of the projects we have, I don't want to, you know, read the laundry list, but the one thing you can pick out is they tend to be pretty emerging technologies, right? Down to the bottom, the, 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 actually the major one I work with is this EV wireless charging. We have 14 competitive organizations, including Qualcomm, that are looking at interoperability testing of wireless charging. And we'll probably do another one of those next year. Um, and what we've got in the pipeline are uh, areas like uh, doing um, safety assurance testing for ADS, on new driving systems. Um, doing a cybersecurity trust and authentication uh, uh, governance model um, and those kind of things. So things that kind of take a while to gestate, but once we get going with a paid technical resource, we can we can more agilely develop those things. So now the other main way we do this is with our sister organization, the SAE uh, Industry Technologies Consortia, or ITC, and we have actually been creating uh, consortia in the uh, in the aerospace uh, sector for over a decade. So it's a very well well worn path there. We are just now starting to do this. Maybe you've seen some of the press releases, and uh, actually Ford is is one of our first um, uh, major companies that have gotten into one of our automotive uh, consortia. Uh, but the mission of SAE's Industry <coughs> Technologies Consortia is to bring together industry in these more pre-competitive areas, so that we can kind of cobble together and co collaborate but not in a, in a truly, fully open where anyone who wants to knock on the door and come in can get in. So the idea is this is actually a 501c6, which is akin to a trade organization, whereas SA International is a C3, and so basically anyone with the subject matter expertise who raises his or her hand can get into our standards development. So this allows us to move more briskly in areas where industry is really not getting together on their own. And I think there was a question for the Ford speaker about, well, who are you working with? And I, this is a way that we see that we can really not only unlock you know, cooperation and collaboration, but I'm hoping crowdsourcing, right? Because uh, what is it? 1.3 million people a year die globally in car wrecks, right? So if I can bring it, if we can bring it home and to market a year early, it's 1.3 million people. That's, that's a pretty good day's work. What if it's five years? We will have prevented World War One essentially. Right? So that's the kind of drum beat that I march to. And so this is our first uh, uh, big box consortium that's got Ford, GM, and Toyota in it, Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium. And what they're focused on is a raft of projects. I think the first one is uh, um, fallback ready user driving, uh, uh, um, driving um, uh, professional development. So what do you have to do if you're behind the wheel? just in case. So, and we saw last year in Phoenix that that person couldn't quite up to the task. But um, I think that took two months to develop, and it's, it's going to be up very soon. Um, but I think there's 10 projects in the pipeline right now. Uh, that roadmap was really put together by these guys. And my colleague, Ed Strobe, uh, is the project manager, and he just kind of pulls everything together, project manages it, and he actually does some technical development. And then this is another new one we have, the International Alliance for Mobility Testing and Standardization. I always have to look at, look at that mouthful. And that's a little more on the proving ground test facility side. Another colleague of mine, uh, John Tintinelli, runs that one. And uh, you know the mission and value proposition are there. The idea, again, behind all these is this is pre-competitive research. We don't have to wait that long time for the standard. And what's nice is we're getting so much opt-in. In fact, that first... Uh, this consortium is kind of the worst kept secret in history of the, of the industry. A bunch of people knew about this in the industry and they kept banging on my door or others and they couldn't really say anything yet. So this will probably be five to ten strong, certainly, by the end of the year. Um, now, what's on the roadmap? Um, I've got a colleague, Andy Chang, who is uh, developing a micro mobility, uh, secure mobility data sharing consortium. We've actually announced that. It's not fully developed and underway yet, but uh, that should be impending in the next month or so. Um, and then I am working on trying to bring the industry together to look at authentication and trust. Um, I think uh, one thing that we, we didn't see is, how are we going to secure all those millions of messages that kind of go out every tenth of a second? And so there's a incredibly huge and intricate PKI-based system called Security Credential Management System. That's going to come out later. We have probably six or seven other use cases in vehicles right now that we need that for. 
Um, and then automated vehicle, I talked about uh, the, our first two, but we're really looking at working with NHTSA actually, is very, knock on wood, we've got some very good discussions uh, of looking at validation val uh, and ve verification and validation and really safety assurance testing for ADS. And that'll be probably you know three to five year program until we get there. But I think that's really what we truly need to push this technology out and get the consumer feedback, consumer drive, because right now I think the stats show that people think they can drive better than an automated vehicle. So by doing this, they'll at least see that, hey, there's a measure of safety. It's really objective, not this subjective safety. So that's really where we're, we're headed with that. And with that, that is my contact information. I assume all these slides will be made available. Yeah, so, I assume so. OK. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Up next is uh, Manish Marotra. He is the Director of Digital Business Planning and Connected Operations for Hyundai. Thank you for being a great assistant. Um, I was talking with Manish earlier, and we were talking about sort of the user experience and what happens in a car. And I kind of said, back in the old days, you kind of got in your car, and you had a real key, and you stuck it in the ignition, and um, you... Uh, your radio buttons were actual buttons, they weren't touch screens, and um, it was a little bit different experience. And it was one of those things that, um, it was, seemed pretty simple when you went to use it. And now, is it more simple? Is it more complicated? Is it better? I'm not sure, but I think Manish can kind of help us with that. All right. All right. Director of Digital Planning and Connected Operations at Hyundai. And thank you for having me here today. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things, uh, something that John was mentioning. And these are exciting new features coming to Hyundai models very soon. Both are brilliant and first-to-market innovations that will change the relationship between your two favorite devices, your phone and your car. And both relate to one simple question, you know, why is this so important? And I'm not talking about the auto box. I'm actually not talking about the auto box. So you see, at, like Hyundai, our mission is to differentiate our vehicles with best in class and consistent experiences. And we don't see technology just as another feature. We see a bigger picture. And we, we feel that your in-car life needs to be part of your entire life. And Technology is the essential link that brings it all together. So now, next to your car, the technology that you will start depending on more is your smartphone. And, and when you think about it, both your phone and your car are very personal. For example, people give names to their cars. Everyone has their own seat positions, side mirrors, uh, settings is different. And of course, your favorite radio station presets. And when, when it comes to your phones, show sure, they're Apple fans, they're Android fans. And everyone has their favorite apps laid out differently on the home screen. And don't even talk about how many different auto box or the phone cases you can get. So it's cool to find new ways to get our two favorite devices work even better together and try to make them more personal. Now, coming back to the smartphones, I mean, they've replaced so much of what we used to carry around. It's your address book, it's your MP3 player, it's your camera, it's your newspaper, it's your wallet. Not to forget, it, it was designed to be a phone. But <coughs> today, we still have to carry these giant set of car keys. These are miles, by the way, not mine. Now, with Hyundai Digital Key, you can literally leave these set of keys at home. All you need is this favorite device. 
using near field communication, also known as NFC, you know, think Apple Pay, or Bluetooth Low Energy, which is also called DLE, think the connection between your smartwatch and your phone. The digital key will securely connect your Sonata to lock, unlock, and remote start your car. And it's super easy to use. Just one touch on the door handle, you get the haptic feedback, and the car is unlocked, you're ready to go. Once inside is when your smartphone and your car become best of friends. The Qi wireless charger is not a charger anymore, it is the ignition interface. When you put the phone on it, it not only charges, but also lets you start your car. When your digital key is recognized, the Sonata automatically adjusts your personal settings, things like the mirrors, the seats, and your audio presets. This digital key is handy for other reasons too. <clears throat> when your key is digital, you can securely share it with another person, say your son, all via the, via the app. Mom or dad can now virtually toss the key to the teen driver from anywhere. So when your son's car won't start and he needs to borrow your car, he can easily do that from the parking lot of my office with zero disruptions. While mom and dad still continue to make arrangements for the tow of his car. And yes, you can take that key back virtually when he no longer needs it or when you don't want to have your team driver possess that key. So it's a pretty awesome feature and nobody else offers it with this degree of personalization or at the price point of a Sonata. And I know we've been talking a lot about cybersecurity. This technology is very secure using a multi-layered cybersecurity uh, platform. So now let's go beyond the phone. You might know Blue Link is Hyundai's connected car service. And we're constantly making that technology better. A perfect example, right alongside the launch of our new Sonata, Blue Link will introduce a new personalized remote start. We've added seat cooling and heating controls to the app, so the interior is just the way you or your passengers like it. This feature is really good on cold winter mornings. In fact, in January alone, our customers performed more than 3 million remote starts. And features like Blue Link Remote Start work with the virtual assistant in your home and pocket. In this case, I'm talking about the Google Home or the Google Assistant on your phone. Now, this feature was brought to the market with a lot of hit and trial. And thankfully, our company allows us with the resources and the ability to take some risks. Does anyone remember these? Right? Now, these never got off the ground, but when we first saw them in 2014, we thought, how awesome would it be to start your car while you're walking towards it in a parking lot and you don't even have to touch the phone? Well, the good thing was that this work led to the development of our smartwatch apps. Now, these new watch apps also use the voice commands to remote start your car using Siri or the Google Assistant. Then all of a sudden, Hyundai owners could say things to their smart speakers, your Alexas and Google Homes of the world, things like, okay, Google, tell Blue Link to start my Santa Fe and set the temperature to 72 degrees. Or okay, Alexa, or actually, Alexa is not okay. Okay, Alexa, ask Blue Link to start charging my Ionic. Or okay, Google, ask Blue Link to lock my car. Earlier this month, at Google I.O., Google introduced the next generation assistant that is 10 times faster, and Hyundai was ready. We streamlined our integration and removed the Ask Blue Link portion of the voice commands and were able to add the Blue Link to the Google Assistant routines. Now all you have to say is, hey Google, good morning, and the assistant will brief you on the weather, share a traffic update, and tell you how much charge your Kona Electric has. How cool is that? Now, I want to talk about the future for just a minute. 
an AI platform is something we are also exploring. This platform will connect an owner's busy life even more seamlessly between home, work, and play while limiting pain points that can arise. We asked, what if we could sync calendars for all family members and all vehicles in the garage, resolve scheduled conflicts, and send alerts via seamless voice interactions while driving, or alerts when you are outside the car or in the park state. So let me give you an example. Picture busy parents getting ready to start their day. They check the family's link schedule on the companion app, companion app in their phones. And on the way to drop off the kids at school, the app can deliver a reminder listing the kids' activities. And it, of course, already knows the best route to take to avoid traffic. <coughs> this companion app can also deal with the unexpected and solve scheduled conflicts between parents. If one of them has an important meeting come up, which happens to most of us, this app can alert the other parent to pick up the kids. <coughs> when the scheduled conflict has been resolved, the app would send the best route and the task list to the other vehicle. And while on the way home, they can remotely turn on the oven so it's ready to cook the dinner the moment they arrive. And even as they're pulling in the driveway, they can use the Internet of Things to turn on the lights, open the garage, and connect to a smart speaker to keep the music playing. In the end, I hope you understand how Hyundai is bringing mobile devices and cars together <coughs> and making the experiences very personalized. We're able to do this because we've supplied our teams with the right resources, but more importantly, the right mindset where it's okay to take risks. And this is important for any technology to succeed. You know, invest in the technology, invest in the people, then one day you will find that technology is making life better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Let's see, we'll take your microphone back. And um, I wish my wife's car had a, uh, had a virtual key because she just called me. She's stuck in a parking garage in Boston near a hospital, and her key's stuck in her ignition, and the car won't shut off. We, we can solve it. We can, you can, you, you can, you can solve that? Uh, so, uh, I said to her, call AAA. I don't know. <laughs> At this point, I'm not, uh, I said I'm a little tied up for the next few hours. So, uh, uh, Great. you don't need a little radio. Yeah. If, if, if you see a, if you see a uh, black Volkswagen Beetle convertible that's running forever, you know it's probably her. Um, John Lennon is the vice president of Risk Aware Driving at Toyota Research Institute. Um, and he's done a lot of work on autonomous driving, especially focused on the Guardian Research Project. Um, it, you know, when we talk about the user experience, whether it's the user experience, uh, like our folks from Hyundai talked about, and earlier I was joking about not investing in OtterBox, and I should invest in the in the vision technology. I probably would have invested in Google Glass, and maybe I would have got a pair of glasses out of it, but probably that's about it. So. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's interesting how the whole technology changes depending on how you look at it. Whether you look at it in a augmented reality windshield type technology or whether it's um, you know, on how your vehicle is going to communicate with vehicles around it, the infrastructure and uh, everything else. So, uh, I guess my home is uh, very backwards compared to uh, uh, my, I can't tell my refrigerator to do anything or my stove. Or, um, but TV barely wants to talk to me. But uh, uh, John Lennon, Vice President of Risk Aware, driving with uh, Toyota Research Institute. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, it's really a great pleasure to speak to you again. And uh, I want to say a special thank you to Paul, my MIT colleague. So I am an MIT professor who was on leave helping to create Toyota Research Institute. And now I keep a role um, for TRI as a consultant trying to, to help um, uh, bring this guardian concept to a reality. And uh, so a little uh, about my background. Well, this photo shows our P2 
platform, which is a new platform that we're uh, going to demonstrate uh, to the public at the Tokyo Olympics in 2020. Um, and for me, I feel my background, I feel so uh, lucky, blessed in terms of the career that I've had. Of, um, uh, I'm a roboticist. I came to MIT after grad school to work on autonomous underwater vehicles. And I work on the problem of how robots build maps and use those maps to navigate. And that has many applications, but one, it is one of the foundational technologies for a lot of self-driving car pro programs. And through various uh, sort of um, parts of my career, I've interacted with ever more parts of the MIT campus. But um, I, uh, and I care about the impact of technology on society. One of my service jobs right now is I'm part of the MIT task force on work of the future, where we're thinking about the impact on jobs of, of automation. And so I think it's very important for us to be mindful of the impact that our technology has on society. And really, it's about trying to make the world a better place and be mindful. At MIT, we're very optimistic that technology can uh, improve uh, people's lives. And so, um, but this, this is a Toyota talk. I'm really proud to be part of Toyota Research Institute. And just a little bit of brief history, and I wish I had an hour. Um, I'm showing that this is a picture of our 2007 DARPA Urban Challenge vehicle. I was the team leader for MIT uh, for a team of students, faculty uh, that competed for a $2 million prize in the government competition. Uh, and to make a, we, we had a, our vehicle used um, laser scanners that were just becoming available uh, and advanced motion planning algorithms. And to, to um, our, uh, if our, to make a very long story short, um, uh, we, we, we came in fourth place in the challenge, but the real sort of victory was what our students and postdocs are doing now. So in our team photo in the upper left there, uh, uh, I'll have had more time to tell you all of the startups and other kind of companies and other OEMs that our, our team members are involved with. And really at MIT, our product is our students that go on to sort of impact society. Um, and, and for me, it's been such a wonderful opportunity to be part of the Toyota Research Institute where I can think about uh, uh, impact on, on, on products. And so uh, this map shows our three TRI locations. So we're in, we're in uh, Los Altos, California, just outside Palo Alto, near Stanford, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, near the University of Michigan, uh, and here uh, in Cambridge, Mass., just a 10-minute walk away from here. And our mandate is to develop um, not just automated driving technology, but also robotics that can help with aging society and help improve the lives of, of the disabled and, and other folks. We're also working on using AI for material uh, discovery. Um, and, um, we, uh, and we've grown really rapidly, so we're uh, over 300 people now. Uh, this photo shows our a recent off-site, uh, on-site picture in California at our, at our headquarters. And uh, the, um, if you think about the SAE driving levels, so, so thanks to the previous um, speaker, Tim, um, I'm sure you're familiar with sort of level two autonomy, level three, level four. Um, I, I'll actually be honest, I'm a bit of a skeptic and contrarian on when full level four autonomy is going to arrive at scale. I just think it's going to take a lot longer than folks think. And just to review, <coughs> level one is when one degree of freedom is controlled, for example, longitudinal adaptive cruise control. Level two is when two or more functions are automated, and then level two, it requires constant vigilance from the driver uh, to take over at any time. Level three, uh, the system then gives the driver some notice for taking over, and it must have the kind of self-awareness to know when its operating conditions are uh, not, not being met, when its requirements. And then level four, uh, so, but, uh, sorry, so in level two and level three, we like to think of it as the human guarding the AI system. For example, Tesla Autopilot's a good example. And level two has a role, for example, a traffic jam assist in various sort of situations. But in general, people are not good at maintaining vigilance for a very long time monitoring an AI system. Now, now level four and level five, the human is just a passenger. And um, really, the difference is the operational domain. How restricted is it? And I believe in the long-term vision to bring uh, free mobility, like the sort of freedom of movement uh, to, to folks uh, in the long term uh, for folks like, like Paul, that we can, we can really succeed in that mission, but it's, it's not going to come next year. It's going to take a while. So these are really hard problems. Um, and just look around, just think about driving in Boston, driving in New England, how challenging it can be. And so, um, at Toyota Research Institute, we're developing a common software system, we call an autonomy stack, 
with a lot of overlap between two different functions. So the level four function we call chauffeur, uh, but we have this something that's a bit different, we think, in the industry we call guardian, Toyota guardian, where instead of having the human guard the AI system, can we invert that and make sort of a super ADAS system or a system um, where you're still the human driver responsible for the car doing your best effort at driving. But we bring all the tools of robotics, the um, motion planning, perception, prediction, control, and we bring them to bear to try to provide a sort of safety envelope to try to dramatically improve your safety. And the idea is that the AI can guard the human. So it's a bit like, say, emergency braking or other things that are in the industry now. But think about that on steroids. Think about all the capabilities of well, my, to me, to make it really simple, it's what do we need to do? Stay on the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. <laughs> if you can do that, you, you solve a lot of problems, right? So we've been working hard on the Guardian concept, you know, envisioned by our CEO, Gil Pratt, um, back um, just before uh, TRI was, was launched <coughs> um, in early 2016. And <clears throat> I know we've talked recently about some of our work with Guardian. And for example, in 2017, uh, at the, uh, towards the end of my first year of, on sabbatical as part of working with Ryan Eustace, a former student who's our Senior Vice President of Automated Driving, a professor in Michigan, um, we developed a, a dual steering prototype. And so uh, we think this is unique. Like, why would you make a car with two steering wheels, two independent steering wheels? But, um, and in fact, my 12-year-old, my who was 10 at the time, I said to him, hey, do you want to see our self-driving car at Toyota? Uh, and he said, Dad, you've seen one self-driving car, you've seen them all. Said, no, our self-driving car is different. It has two steering wheels. And why do we do that? So that you could have uh, a test driver on the right-hand side of the car, the autonomy to take over for the test driver. For example, you could tell someone to fall asleep and have a video of that I could play, but I think we showed it maybe a, a, last year. Uh, and then you could still have a safety driver that could or an operator that could take over from the autonomy system if needed. So in 2017, we showed this sort of discrete handoff of the uh, autonomy system taking over for a driver and then get offering control back, which is really a sort of compelling experience. We did that on a closed course in Texas. Um, in 2018, a key focus for us has been what we call blended envelope control. And so rather than having a discrete on-off transition of the car versus the human uh, in terms of the, the, the trade-offs, um, what we've envisioned is like almost inspired by the way fighter jets work, where you define a sort of safety envelope in terms of the operation of the car. And this is just some of our amazing team. We've had we have, you know, several hundred engineers on the project, and uh, uh, recruiting strong talent is one of the biggest challenges. And, and really, we, we have just a, um, this particular group, we have some folks from Stanford, from Chris Garrity's group, who are real experts in, in bringing vehicles to the limits of their control. Uh, and just to give a quick overview of what we showed, um, we, uh, this is closed course testing at um, ACM Willow Run uh, in Michigan. And the, um, we've uh, got a few different kind of prototype concepts that we've demonstrated. Let me try to show you. Uh, let's see if I can. So this video shows on the left is a sort of an outside view. And then this is uh, showing a sort of part of what's happening in the car's sort of brain and sort of the car's operating system. Um, uh, in this sort of demonstration, there are a bunch of cones that define a sort of corridor, and using the perception, the cones are detected, and we instruct the human driver, try to hit the cones. So imagine a teenager that's taking the curve too fast, uh, maybe they're inexperienced, or distracted, heaven forbid, but if, imagine if the car has this sort of awareness of where is the road and it can override, and basically the car makes it so that you can't hit the cones. And so the green sort of corridor is the sort of safety region that the car, the control algorithm will keep you in. Um, the next example, and just to, because of time, they're pretty quick uh, examples. We've, um, def you can define a guardian slalom course, where here, shown on the left is the outside view, and this is the computer view, where in the first pass through the video, um, you can see the human driver hits a cone. So we could say to you, uh, you know, try to drive through the song course at 30 miles an hour, and with the, the car's handling and, and just the cones being so tight, it's, it's really impossible for a human driver to do that. But what the Guardian gives you is sort of a superhuman perception and control capabilities so that the car will intervene and take over and keep the car in the green safety region, uh, and you can just slam it and, uh, and it'll go through cones with, with very minimal human 
operation. So this is just a little sort of flavor of what we've been up to. But the idea is to try to, I think that the Guardian offers this approach where it's human amplification. Can we turn people into better, safer drivers, but keep, this, keep the fun of driving? I mean, I, I know Boston driving, commuting sometimes, I live in Newton, it can be a pain in the neck to get home sometimes in rush hour. But and for the most part, I love driving, I love cars, and I, and I, and I sometimes level four, I, I, you know, I've, I've been in self-driving cars and it's an awesome experience, but sometimes you feel like a FedEx package sitting in the back, you know? <laughs> and, and so how do we keep the joy of self-driving and keep driving safe? And so we're pursuing a sort of general approach to provide all this. So, um, and just a little on the research front, the sort of things we're working on, we, we have this sort of uh, vision we call radical, robust autonomous driving incorporating cameras and learning, and our research team is working on a lot of algorithms for this thing called SLAM, mapping and localization, how robots build maps and navigate, doing the perception on board using machine learning, feeding that to the cloud, harvesting data, the driver state estimation, so using driver monitoring cameras is really important in our approach. Uh, and one of the real challenges, like if you want to do a PhD at a place like MIT or Stanford, uh, and if you, you know, raise your hand, is in, in tech prediction. Can you predict, is that pedestrian going to cross the road? Is that car um, going to make a right on red? How do you, we have a, an sort of innate almost like ability to, to solve physics problems and social negotiation problems as we drive. How do we get that into cars so that we can make them better anticipate what's going to happen next? So um, some conclusions, I'm really excited to have a chance in being part of the automating driving team at TRI. Um, we're working on this unified technology stack to address this, what we call Guardian, and, and also chauffeur uh, a key focus the last year has been this blended envelope control, um, but it's just the tip of the spear of a much larger research effort trying to really exploit to it as data advantage, uh, you know, harvesting data from the fleet to, to, to make better and better algorithms. And it is going to take a lot longer than folks think, but um, I think the potential impact is still really great. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's interesting. When we started this topic, it was all about the automotive user experience. And we're kind of going everywhere from really sort of what that user experience is going to be to almost one when we talk about level four vehicle autonomy where there's almost no user experience. Like, I, I, I love the line, and I'm going to steal it from now on, is, um, you know, you feel like a FedEx package, you know, in the back of a self-driving vehicle, and, and it is, uh, there are probably times I want to feel that way, and there are times I don't. I, I said to a couple people this morning, uh, I live about 22 miles from here, and I work about 50 miles from work. It takes me an hour and 15 minutes to get to work, it took me about two hours to get here. So the vehicle driving experience was um, less than great this morning. And whether it was the construction around here or the general traffic. And, oh, by the way, I left my house at 6 a.m. So traffic was still off. And, and there are times where I look at how can that, how can that experience, whether it's, whether it's the type of experience that happens with self-driving vehicles are just a more pleasurable experience when you're inside your car. Kelly Funkhauser is the Program Manager for Vehicle Usability and Automation at Consumer Ports. Um, I knew her more when she worked for Dr. David Strayer and, uh, uh, in Utah, uh, working on a lot of the distracted driving studies that, that AAA has uh, participated in, and we looked at a lot of distracted driving and found out that uh, People suck as drivers. That's really what comes down to. They get very distracted. And uh, uh, Kelly's going to join us. She has been with Consumer Reports for how long? Just over a year. Just over a year. Yeah. Huh? The floor is yours. Okay, so I'm really excited to be on this panel of all of you smart minds that create all the technology that I get to play with every day. Uh, I really appreciate that. Whether it's you know the crazy or or the safety, it's all a lot of fun every day. So I'm going to hopefully have a slightly different approach to what I'm talking about today in uh, connected vehicle technology since I get to experience it from the consumer point of view. And we also get to, at Consumer Reports, determine whether those features end up being safety features or if they 
cause more harm than good, like with the distraction. You know, there's, it's really easy to get distracted in the cars, and sometimes that can cause more harm than good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the emerging technologies of connected vehicles. Um, by first, sorry, I feel like I'm moving this way too much. By first talking about um, some of the, the technology that exists right now and, and what's to come as well. So there's a lot of promises for connected vehicle technology in the future. Um, we're hoping that we can reduce a lot of traffic accidents by the, the cars talking to each other or talking to the infrastructure. Um, so regulators are predicting the reduction in accidents just from the connected technology could be up to 80%. Of course, none of the data exists quite yet to know if these will hold true. Um, but we also will see some reduction in fuel consumption. So once the vehicles can optimize the, the green light flow and make all the green lights and stay at a safe and, and consistent speed, then we'll be you know, reducing emissions. Um, and we'll also hopefully get there faster by optimizing that green light flow as well. And this isn't just personal vehicles, but it'll be public transportation, freight, um, and, and everyone else on the road. And so we will actually see a lot of economic value as well in the increase in transit and freight efficiency doing connected vehicles and infrastructure. Um, the, the latest predictions are about 100 and close to 180 billion dollars for in economy savings. So we all know we're moving towards this anyway. Uh, the, these benefits are hopefully going to propel us there as soon as possible. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over some of the differences in these co connected vehicle technologies. Um, and we heard first up today a little bit about the cellular approach um, to connected vehicle technology. And I'm going to describe some of the other approaches as well, which is DSRC. So this is more of a, the, the dedicated spectrum, the 5.9 gigahertz frequency that the government has dedicated for transportation related safety. Um, and this is more along the lines of some of the technology we've seen for years. It's more like a radio. So if you're within proximity of a roadway or some sort of infrastructure, and there's potentially a hazard up ahead. We're all, we've all seen these highway advisory signs where we can tune into the old school AM radio and get localized information about potential weather or roadway hazards within our area. So this is, you know, very early types of vehicle to infrastructure, infrastructure to vehicle communication. It's not exactly what we think of today when we think of connected, but it all kind of lies in this uh, familiar approach. Oops, that was back. Okay, so um, a few years ago, uh, there was this SPAT challenge, so the signal phase and timing challenge, which was um, largely initiated by the Utah DOT and some of the others that wanted to challenge all of the DOTs across the country to implement some of the DSRC and other connected vehicle technologies into their infrastructure. The goal of the challenge was to be able to have the technology spread across the country as quickly as possible to eventually create this web and network of the technology so that it's not just localized. And also the technology will be similar and be able to be interoperable between the states. So these are some of the, the cities highlighted here that um, have started the deployment of this SPAT challenge uh, in green, and this map is actually slightly a little old, so there's more than what's up here. But the blue dots are where the uh, infrastructure to vehicle communication is active right now. So it's pretty widespread and it's growing all the time. So as far as vehicles, we have seen some DSRC technology in vehicles. So this is a picture of the instrument cluster on the Cadillac CTS that was equipped with DSRC radio. And these Cadillacs were able, and still are, they're on the road today, 
uh, communicate with each other on some of the basic safety messages. So as you can see here, this Cadillac is receiving a heartbreaking <coughs> ahead message from another Cadillac that's up the road. So that now it's warning the driver in advance to be able to react much quicker. So the, the technology is in the infrastructure, it's in the vehicles, and it's all something that's pretty familiar to a lot of people. In my home state of Utah, uh, I mentioned the Utah DOT as being one of the leaders on the SPET challenge. They are right now collecting a lot, a lot of data on how well the DSRC works. So they have this roadway here on your right um, is a signalized roadway with 47 different intersections in a row that have the DSRC uh, messages and they're attached to the, the traffic light signals. So they are communicating with public transportation buses to communicate the, the schedule and efficiency and timeliness of those buses in conjunction with the signal phasing. So how it works is the buses that are equipped with the GSRC are traveling along this roadway here and they, if they're five minutes behind schedule or more, currently the threshold is five minutes, they're playing a little bit with that number to go down to uh, quantify the impact of, of changing that number as well. So if they're five minutes behind, they can request at the next intersection to either have the green lights stay green a few seconds longer or turn green a few seconds earlier. This is to hopefully get them back onto their schedule and back on track to uh, have all their passengers make potential connections. So what they're looking at right now is the increase in schedule efficiency, so how timely the buses are. This roadway was selected because it had the worst schedule adherence out of all of the roadways in the valley. And so they have seen, which doesn't seem like a huge number, but actually is in, in transit, a 6% increase in their bus on schedule <coughs> time. And um, they are, um, they've also looked at the surrounding intersections and the traffic flow to see how that impacts you know, if they're, if they're holding that green light a little bit longer, now is that affecting all of the other uh, cross traffic? And so far they have not found any significant effects of this um, signal uh, priority type of DSRC communication. They recently, this past winter, equipped their snow plows with DSRC technology and added a whole bunch more of the, the roadways around Salt Lake, some of the main corridors going into the city with the DSRC signalized intersections. And these work slightly different where the snow plow, instead of requesting the, the lights stay green or, or turn green early, they're actually saying, I'm approaching this intersection and I want it to turn green now. And so they don't have any data that is available for me to present, but they do have uh, reports that the snow plow operators did say they saw an increase in their uh, scheduling and their, their efficiency in getting their routes cleared, which hopefully will eventually um, impact the safety of all those traveling on those roads as well. So these are currently going on and they're collecting a lot of data both in Salt Lake City and around the country to be able to quantify some of these benefits of the DSRC. Okay, so cellular um, applications that are currently on the market. Here's an example of uh, the, the signal phase and timing, telling the vehicle how long the light is going to remain red before it turns green. Sometimes it does the other way around, how long it has left in the green. Sometimes it will tell you if the speed that you're currently traveling at will allow you to get through the light, uh, green light to get that green light flow. Um, and uh, it, it also tells you, you know, yellow lights coming up and um, with it, if you're in the, the geographic region of where these signals are connected. <coughs> so the image on the left and on the top are both a third party application called Enlightened by Connected Signals. The one on the left is a phone app. It's on iOS and on Android 
anyone can download it. And if you're within one of these cities or areas where the DOT has allowed this third party to come in and, and put their API into the, the traffic management system, then they can collect the data from the DOTs and then go through their process behind the scenes of interpreting the data um, and also making predictions as to what signal and the timing is on the current light or and the next uh, light phase as well. Um, this bottom one here is the same type of a system, which is in the Audi. So the top top one is the same type of uh, or the same app, but it, this is the integration into the BMW display, and this one on the bottom is the Audi display here. So this one works pretty similarly in that if you're approaching an intersection, you get close enough, it will tell you. Here it says there's 12 seconds remaining until the light will turn green. So, having experienced the cool technology that all of you guys get to uh, build, um, my experience is that these aren't perfect. They have the potential to get there and provide drivers with a lot of information, but they're working on the 4G, sometimes 3G hardware um, systems right now. There's a lot of issues with latency. There's also other issues that have come about with making inaccurate predictions. So if the, the system, uh, real, you know, at this time of day, it's usually on a, you know, fixed cycle, but then a pedestrian comes to that intersection and then presses that, that cross button, it may actually uh, not communicate that quick enough to the API of the third party and will give the driver then inaccurate information about the color of the light. So um, some of the other consumer concerns that we've heard are that uh, now people are realizing that they have 12 more seconds so they can text on their phone uh, at the light. <laughs> and uh, you know, at least they're doing it while they're stopped. But the problem is that if they have inaccurate information, then um, they, they may be making uh, poor choices there. And if this is the precursor to the automated vehicles, and they're going to be using this to help them go through some intersections, then the technology really needs to advance much more. Hopefully, when 5G is real, we can get up there. Uh, but right now, they're, they're not quite ready for prime time. So all of these slides were labeled DSRC or CV2X. Uh, there has been this battle uh, going on. Panels have been called this, and, and you get everyone from both sides kind of duking it out. And um, over the past few years, it's become a little bit more polarized in the, do we, do we choose the DSRC technology or the cellular to put into our vehicles and our infrastructure? Do we put all of our eggs in one basket? And Really, the answer is, is no, we should, we should be going for both. So the benefits of DSRC, first of all, is it exists. It's real. It's familiar technology. It's out there. Uh, it's relatively cheap to implement into both in infrastructure and into vehicles. Uh, we have seen quantitative benefits from some of these examples in the real world of how they're increasing efficiency um, on the roadways. and. Once the cellular communication is good enough, then it will just be an additional redundant system to help ensure that those messages that are being sent over to SRC are accurate, are timely. Uh, they'll both work together to help some of those issues that came up earlier in the discussion. What about the rural areas? Okay, so maybe they don't have one or the other technologies, but they at least have the one. Um, when we get into canyons and tunnels and bridges and all of those types of issues, uh, they, they will hopefully complement each other. So in this kind of battle, the answer really should be that we're not going to be losing money or time or effort by investing in something that could be saving lives right now. And it still leaves the door open for the technologies to come in and help the DSRC in the future. So. There seems to be a little bit of hesitation from manufacturers and the DOTs as to do we wait, do we invest? There's not a whole lot of leadership coming from regulators. There's not a big push by 
a lot of manufacturers out there either as to which camp we should go with. Should we go with both? Who's doing what? Are we going to be interoperable? Um, but the reality is that if we're going to start to get to some of these promises of reducing accidents, increasing the fuel efficiency, reducing travel time, increasing you know, the transit and freight efficiency, and potentially billions of dollars in economic step, uh, development, um, you know, we need to start doing it now because sooner is, is much better. Um, if we can even save one life right now, I would say that's probably a win. Um, and it's a pretty simple uh, technology that is out there and can be utilized in a lot of different ways. So whenever I talk to people about what I do and I work for Consumer Reports and I work in car testing, everyone asks, you know, well, should I get a new car? What car should I get? And when I ask them what they have, you know, if they have a several year old car, I always recommend that you know, they should probably get a newer model. There's a lot of both crash, crash worthiness um, developments. There's crash avoidance technologies out there. The safety is much better. The technology has just advanced. So they should probably get a new car. But in the same conversation of, you know, well, do I invest in that now or do I wait? Well, you know, what are, are we going to wait for 5G when we could have newer technology now? Are you going to buy this year's model car, or are you going to wait for next year? Because next year is going to be better. The year after that is probably going to be even better. So, you know, do we wait until there's 5G? Do we wait till 6G? 6G will certainly be better than 5G in the, the cellular communication. So, you know, what we should do is, is start now with saving lives. Correct. Right. Hopefully that was a little different perspective. <laughs> Thanks.